The most important thing is to ensure that we all within the department and all of those who support us, all of you who support us, that we understand we are changing our culture. A culture that allows us to focus on policy, which is what we're here to do, and give less than sufficient attention to the resources of our most important resource, our people. We have got to change that when people walk into rooms and see a room looking a particular way and feeling somewhere inside, hmm, maybe everybody that should be here isn't here, people have to speak up. People have to make the effort to ensure that the people who need to be at the table are at the table. As the United States emerges from the trials of the pandemic period, we face many reckonings, not least of which is the future of racial justice in all aspects of our society. And our diplomacy is no exception. For years, observers and diplomats have been raising the alarm about the capacity and the makeup of the US State Department, along with more general worries about investment in effective foreign policy overall. The murder of George Floyd last year brought these matters into sharper focus as protests erupted as far away as Korea, South Africa, Australia, and beyond. In April this year, Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressed these challenges directly, appointing Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Winstonley as the State Department's very first Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. So is State now confronting its pale male Yale image? And if so, how might the effort help make our foreign policy more effective? It's my pleasure to introduce our partner in this program and a friend of World Boston, Ambassador Nicholas Burns. We have a lot to cover today, so I will just briefly mention that he is a professor of the practice of diplomacy and international relations at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also the founder and faculty chair of the Future of Diplomacy project there. In his 27 year career as, professional foreign, as a professional foreign service officer, Ambassador Burns served in many positions, including as ambassador to NATO from 2001 to 2005. Oh, and Ambassador Burns is a lifelong member of Red Sox Nation. This is world Boston people. So Nick, welcome, go right ahead. Mary, thank you for that mercifully brief introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone, welcome. Uh, to World Boston. Thanks very much for being with us. I want to thank Mary Eintema for her really stellar, creative, indefatigable leadership of World Boston. It's a great organization. It's the heart and soul of how people in Boston, many people in Boston stay connected to global affairs. And we are a global city and we have since 1630 been outward looking as a city uh, and as an economy. So thank you to World Boston. It's such a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today with our guest of honor, Ambassador Gina, Gina Abercrombie Winstanley. I have known Ambassador Abercrombie Winstanley for a long time. We served in the Foreign Service together. Uh, I've admired her service to the United States. I admire her intellectual brilliance. I admire her toughness and I admire her determination. These are all very important qualities for the position to which she has just been appointed in recent months by the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken as the first chief diversity and inclusion officer in the history of the Department of State. She's perfect for this role because she's served for such a long time in the Foreign Service. She understands the challenges of the Foreign Service. She was our longest serving ambassador to the um, Republic of Malta, uh, among many other things in her career. She advised the commander of US cyber forces on our foreign policy priorities. She worked on counterterrorism. She was deputy coordinator, in fact, uh, for counterterrorism in the Department of State. She coordinated the largest evacuation of American citizens from a war zone since World War II. She began her career formally as chairperson for the Middle East Area Studies at our Foreign Service Institute in Arlington, Virginia. She served in Baghdad, in Jakarta, in Cairo, and she was special assistant to the Secretary of State for the Middle East in Africa. She's also worked at the Department of Defense as a Foreign Service Officer and at the National Security Council at the White House. She's a recipient of many awards, including our Meritorious and Superior Honor Awards at the State Department. And one that I wanted to um, cite in particular, she was commended 
for acts of courage during an attack on the U.S. Consulate General in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia on December 6, 2004 by Al-Qaeda terrorists. So we commend her for her long service to the Department of State, to our country, and for the courage that she showed and the capacity uh, of diplomatic expertise that she showed during her career. Um, before taking on her current assignment, she was diplomat in residence at Oberlin College in Ohio. Uh, and she's a graduate of the George Washington University, and she's a graduate of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where she has a master's degree. Mary is a graduate of that school, and I am as well. So this is a SICE Johns Hopkins conversation today, which we're really thrilled about. Um, Ambassador, welcome. I know you're in your office at the Department of State, which must be refreshing having lived on Zoom and <laughs> over the last year. Uh, welcome to World Boston. Thank you so much, Nick. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I'm looking forward to a robust engagement and I love the size connections. Thank you very much. And, and Gina, I thought we would start you know, with the big picture here. Um, the recognition by you, by me, by many people, by our Secretary of State, by our President and Vice President, that there is a crisis in the State Department and USAID, a lack of diversity, a lack of, of diversity racially, ethnically, a lack of inclusion. Um, tell us how you see this problem. How serious is it for American diplomacy and how do you think we can all help you in fixing it? Mm, thank you. The problem within the department is one that is reflected among uh, all of us as Americans. Our country is facing, and I believe we are at a very exciting and hopeful time because we have an arrangement of people, of citizens who are focused on it, who recognize it, and who are ready to do something about it. This crisis, as was mentioned in our introduction, was really brought into focus with the murder of George Floyd that we have been after, we've been talking about resolving these issues for a very long time in the nation and for a very long time in the Department of State. And it is my position, it is the position of the Secretary of State that we are very smart people. When we need to resolve issues to get after problems, we're able to do so. And we have this time and all the actors that you mentioned, and I will add Congress, Congress on both sides of the aisle who are saying, let's get this done. It is time to put this to bed. So that's where I am. That was the background to my appointment. Uh, I am thrilled to be working under the leadership of Secretary Blinken, who has been very clear, very sharp uh, in his expectation of all of us and that us includes himself about doing the necessary to ensure that we have a population in the department who feels valued, who feels they're able to reach their potential, and a nation who we all serve, who can look at the department and see themselves reflected. That, that's it. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, you and I testified together with our friend Ambassador Harry Thomas before Chairwoman Barbara Lee's subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee in late March about this. And I, I certainly felt from both Democrats and Republicans on that committee full support for what you were doing um, and for the role that you encumber. Um, we've, we issued a Harvard report on the future of the Foreign Service and diversity and the lack of diversity was one of the major parts of that report. And you were one of our expert witnesses. So I thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of examples for the audience that may not be aware if you haven't served in the government of how uh, of a lack of diversity at the end of 2020 so at the end of the trump administration there were no senior women african-american or latinx officers in the state department leadership at the very top of the state department the seven to ten most senior people of the current or acting assistant secretaries of state and there are 23 of them only two were women or people of color. And here's one that I think people are stunned by. President Obama appointed 46 African-American individuals as ambassador. President George W. Bush appointed 44 African-American ambassadors. President Trump, 
five. So as you took your job, your newest job as chief diversity and inclusion officer, I mean, it seems, I think to me that we were at rock bottom. So what are the, some of the specific reforms that you're gonna be advocating and working on with Secretary Blinken and others to, to, to right this ship? Yeah. Well, we've got two things that we're focused on from the beginning. The most important thing is to ensure that we all within the department and all of those who support us, all of you who support us, that we understand we are changing our culture a culture that allows us to focus on policy, which is what we're here to do, and give less than sufficient attention to the resources of our most important resource, our people. We have got to change that when people walk into rooms and see a room looking a particular way and feeling somewhere inside, hmm, maybe everybody that should be here isn't here, People have to speak up. People have to make the effort to ensure that the people who need to be at the table are at the table. And that means more taking care of each other, of recognizing where there might be choke points or barriers and all of us getting after them. And this is from the leaders at the top all the way through and across the organization. This is not the secretary's problem. It's not my problem. It's all of us. We all have to do that. So it's changing the culture. We're getting after that with how we judge success. In some ways, we're very limited about how we judge it. You know, we talk about substantive knowledge and, and leadership, and we talk about our negotiating skills, and it's a very outward looking assessment. But we are going to look more at how are you helping the health and strength of the organization, and that means the people inside. So that's one part, changing the culture. The other part, you can't make or measure any progress until you know where you are. We are a very risk adverse organization. It, it can be helpful, but it also can stymie progress. So we've got to take that very hard look at ourselves that the GAO reports you know, began to look at some of the numbers to show us we are at rock bottom, but we are going to have to look at those numbers in a disaggregated form, slice and dice. Who are we? Where are we? Why are we in this particular state? And so that is going to take an effort and a change of thought, that culture again, with don't be afraid of the numbers. We've got to have the numbers so that we can make progress and we can measure that progress. Thank you very, very much. As, as you think about your this big, big task ahead of you, are there other parts of the US government that have been much more successful? I mean, a lot of people always point to the military, obviously, mm -hmm. as an escalator up institution for, for the poor in our society, for the disadvantaged, mm -hmm. for minority groups. Um, is, should we be learning more from the military about ROTC, about training, about recruitment? in high schools, not colleges? Yeah, there are, there are a number of things that we can do, big things and small things. And, and one of the things that I've been asking our colleagues is to let my office know about the low hanging fruit. We all know as we have gone through this amazing career, we have you know, stumbled upon or had imposed on or come across or been exposed to things that we say, my goodness, why are we doing it this way? This doesn't make any sense. This could be better. This should be easier. What are those things so that we can make quick improvements in how we work? And then those big things, we are looking at other organizations. Military certainly is one of them. And one of the things that they do that I believe strongly that we need to add is that training flow, those extra bodies that can come and backstop us or allow us to surge where necessary and allow us to train in a way that the Department of State has not as compared to the military. But in order to do that, you know very well, to be able to leave your office to go to six weeks of training, I think your boss would throw him or herself across the doorway before they let you through it. So we need those extra bodies. We're hoping Congress is going to work with us on something like that. Um, so some other things that the military does, but the, the training, that, that ability to search is very, very important. 
Um, other government agencies are doing different things. One of the things I believe possible is that the Department of State can do this and do this well and serve as a model for other agencies. So, you know, we have, the Secretary has put in place this position, this position at a senior level, um, this position that should be able to cut through some of the challenges that have faced others within the building whose job is not full-time fix this problem and allow us to connect with other foreign affairs organizations and, and domestically as well, as well as the White House to gather what works, set aside what doesn't and share those best practices as well. Thank you very much. Um, in many ways, this is already the most diverse administration in American history. If you look at the cabinet, President Biden's appointees, I've, as someone outside the State Department, I've certainly heard the passion and clarity with which Secretary Blinken, our Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, have been talking about this issue. That to me is a very good start. Um, do you think, and, and you're a pioneer, you're the first person to ever encumber this position. Are your authorities sufficient so that you can push change? Um, obviously you'll have the support of the senior leadership but the rest of this big bureaucracy will recognize you uh, and your position as a position that needs to be respected. Do you feel you have those authorities? Yeah, well, that's a great question. My, my answer might be different tomorrow or different yesterday than today, but today I'll tell you, yes, I think I do have those authorities. Um, a lot of it, speaking very honestly, will remain to be seen in so far as I am building a team and once we have full congressional, you know, acceptance, because you have to go through and do the, the, you know, groundwork, which were congressional notifications and consultations, and we're just ending that period, which is very important. Um, and I've been clear with our supporters on the Hill that we are depending on them, like all of you, to hold us accountable, to ask us the tough questions. So you've just asked me a tough question. Can I do this? Will the building let me do it? And it is today, the answer is yes, but we are going to be pushing envelopes. We are going to be breaking China. There's no way around it. Um, a senior official who has done some of the work on this said to me in our initial call, she said, Gina, the easy stuff has been done. The easy stuff has been done. So we will not be trying to make enemies of all of our colleagues. We are going to work together. And I can tell you that there is such desire for improvement within the building that I'm very hopeful that people will be allies, that I can grow what I call a large posse within as well as without to help us get this work done. I've begun messaging because that's the first thing we've got to let people know what it is that we expect ourselves of them. So transparency, intentionality, accountability. Those words we keep saying over and over, hear them because we're going to be judging you by them. We expect to be judged by them. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you talk about quite rightly changing the culture. I actually think that your position, the announcement of the position and the announcement of you as the first incumbent has been greeted with great, great optimism and favor across the board. I think most people recognize that changes should be made. What we talked about in our congressional testimony, I think all of us in one way or another said, but it can't fall just on you, on Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Winstanley or Secretary Blinken. It's got it. Every person in the State Department has to feel it's their responsibility. That's a cultural change that's going to take a long time. How do you what, what, what ways can you use to, to make that clear to people and to have them ex not just accept it, but to want to push forward with you for progress? Yeah. yeah, I will say a lot of people are already there. Um, as you said, uh, the reception has been deeply humbling, sir, deeply humbling. And, and I've, I've lost a few nights of sleep because I am feeling this responsibility and this yearning for a better organization. You know, I might cry a little bit. I love the Department of State. So many of us 
do. It is extraordinary work, an extraordinary privilege to be here. And for all that we give and sacrifice, and sacrifice absolutely is the watchword. I can think of years that I have been without my children, without my spouse, um, sacrifices of missing deaths, illnesses in my own family, celebrations in my own family because I was overseas someplace doing the work of the nation, never ever regretting it or second guessing it, but acknowledging that it has had a cost on me personally, on my wider family. We love this organization, but it must do better by all of us and by those who haven't had the the luck of my own career and path. And I say it shouldn't take luck. It shouldn't be dependent on being connected to the right people to have your work recognized. That's something we have to change. That goes to the transparency part. Um, so many are looking for that change that I feel I'm going to be empowered, that people will be helping me formally and informally to get the information, to make the changes, to ask the tough questions and to demand change among us all, whether it is allies, because my allies over the years, nobody wants to feel they got a position that they didn't deserve. Everybody wants to feel like I'm here, I got this because I've done the work for it. So whether it's allies who say, I want to make sure this playing field is level because I want to know I deserve to be, to have the title, to have the position, to have the program, whatever it is. And those who are striving for those accolades, for those positions, for that, that ability and privilege to contribute to the security and safety uh, of the United States. We all want the same things. And that's why I feel Overall, because everybody's not there, and that goes to the other small part that can be a challenge to say, but Secretary Blinken observed in his announcement of me that I, I'm not always uh, diplomatic. I hope in the right times not being diplomatic, but this is a solid train on a specific track, and it's going. And y'all need to get on board. How's that? I think that's the right message. I think when I introduced you, I, I, I tried to pay you a compliment by saying, among your many um, attributes, you're tough-minded. And it would seem to me that you need to be tough-minded in your job because you're gonna be, as you said, breaking China, pushing change, not always easy. Um, I wanted to ask you a specific question related to that. One of the takeaways from our report, and there are lots of reports that were done mm -hmm. in 2020, thinking about the future of the Foreign Service. One of the things that leapt out at us is that we are actually in some ways recruiting for diversity. We're mm -hmm. identifying uh, young women and men who are diverse in their lives in colleges and graduate schools. They're accepting the Foreign Service. They're going into the Foreign Service. I see this with our Pickering, Wrangell, and Payne fellows at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And yet they're leaving in the many of them in the first 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we talked to a lot of these people who say they didn't feel it's the word inclusion included in the culture. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, the challenges there. Yeah. That's a big challenge. It is a huge challenge because we are told when we come in, we are personally responsible for navigating our own careers. We are personally responsible for the success of our own careers. So you're, you're told at the beginning, we're going to toss you out there and you better swim. But we as an organization can do better than that. You'll, you know, some people will swim. Um, they, they may knock a few people while they're swimming. You know, they may lift themselves up by pushing somebody else's head down. But those are not the people that we're trying to keep. Those are not the people that we want. We are trying to make an organization that is more humane and therefore gets more out of everyone. So yes, you are responsible for your own career, but as a manager, as a, a leader, as a, a senior leader or a mid-level leader, 
We are responsible for those who are coming behind us. So one of the things we'll be working on is our mentorship program. I've participated as a mentee over the years. I participated as a mentor over the years. But this is a program that is hit or miss, as someone described it to me yesterday. We're the Department of State. We can do better. We can do better. And we have, this office has specific ideas that we're going to be adding to that program to make it more focused and intentional about how mentors and mentees spend their time together to ensure that both parties get something useful out of it. Mostly the mentee, in all honesty, but the mentor knowing that they left valuable information, focused information, pertinent information for a mentee to help navigate their own career. That kind of engagement is important. We do a lot of it happenstance, serendipitously, you know, you're a people person, so you might reach out and have somebody over for coffee to talk through. You know, if you're an extrovert, you might set up a gathering of either entry-level officers or entry-level and mid-level officers as a meet and greet kind of thing. But that's, shouldn't it shouldn't just be based on personality. We have to put things in place that that launch these things as a matter of course. Thank you very, very much. And um, I think you and I, who both served in the Foreign Service, understand what a great weakness this is in the State Department, that we lack diversity, that we're not, we've not been an inclusive culture. How about the impact on our foreign policy itself? Uh, do you worry that because we are not a diverse institution, the actual policy and the application of the policy and diplomacy has suffered as well. And the converse, of course, is that with a more diverse uh, group in the State Department, in the Foreign Service, and the Civil Service, we might be able to make the argument that we'll be more successful in the way we relate to other countries and other cultures. Well, I think that's exactly right. And I think most people understand that um, immediately, it, you know, in addition to the logic and that it feels right as well. Um, that we will bring people with experiences and native tongue languages and all the rest of it brought to bear for the foreign policy priorities of the United States and that balance of looking at it outwardly from the United States, but understanding the area, the issues in a more holistic and authentic way is going to help us get that policy better. Not just right, because there may not be a right, but better. And so adding those additional inputs of knowledge and experience absolutely is going to help our foreign policy. And you know that, that business case you know, is the one that any of us can stand on. Don't do it for you, do it because it's going to be better for the United States. Absolutely. Right, and I think right. a, very, a very specific argument for pushing an agenda of change for diversity inclusion is in language, language training and language acquisition because one of the hallmarks of the Foreign Service in particular has been the fact that we're the people in the US government with language skills. It takes, it took me a long time to speak really horrible Arabic, for instance, <laughs> when I was a junior officer. But if you can recruit a young Egyptian American or a young Chinese American or a young Indian American to speak the really difficult languages, we're ahead of the game. It, it just is. seems to work on all levels, doesn't it? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. It, there's no doubt about that. Um, and frankly, having colleagues like that help the rest of us, you know, improve our language abilities. So. Right. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Gina. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go to questions. I know there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. Uh, we have a very large group on online with us, which we're pleased about. And I think Mary um, Eintema is going to lead that part of this discussion. I am. And uh, OK, let's go. Uh, yes, we'll go to Irv Kintner first. Uh, my, my question is preceded by the, this comment that uh, I want to bring up because we're, we're challenged even in our board uh, to try to bring in uh, a diverse group of, uh, of people to our board. And I'm always challenged with this idea of birds of a feather flock together. I've seen this in corporate America where we tend to bring in the people that we know and they tend to be people like us where we're sort mm -hmm. of hiring in our own image. 
So the question I have is how do you overcome the recruiting and mentoring challenges of identifying and attracting a diverse population, um, people of color, um, uh, people of uh, immigrants, like you may discuss, to a career in diplomacy? Yeah. Yeah, it is a challenge. I think I heard Secretary uh, Austin say apples, you know, choose apples. You know, that was the phrase, but of uh, people like us. It, it does take intentionality, sir. You're, you're going to have to decide to do it. And it's not that it's harder, but you've got to be intentional about it. And so in your, you know, realm, it is friends of friends of friends of, or maybe not friends of, but going to organizations or schools if you're looking for younger people to say, you know, put yourself forward as a possible uh, mentor. There are a number of organizations that have these sorts of programs. And again, it's going to take intentionality to do that work, to make those connections. Um, I, I think we all understand that value. So I think, you know, organizations will be working harder to bring in people you know, as sponsors, as mentors. There's one in, in my hometown of Ohio that focuses on new immigrants. And, you know, they found me and of course I said yes. So I've got a mentee there who is from uh, Nepal, you know, and, and uh, learning a lot about the culture and helping her navigate school because she's in school in the States, but she hopes to join the Nepalese diplomatic court, which I am urging her to do exponentially. I, I, I'm urging her to do. To, to open that aperture and expand it. So intentionality, also going perhaps to um, organizations that are um, associations, if you've got expertise that you would like to offer people, that's one way of finding, you know, the there are, for every association out there, there's likely to be one that is focused on minorities as well. So, you know, if, you are an IT person. There is an IT association for Black IT folks, you know, who do that. And so you can find those. But intentionality, I think, is going to help all of us get across this. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to our next question, I'm actually going to circle back uh, to uh, where we just were, because it's it's so related to what you were saying, Ambassador. Um, could you kind of maybe close the circle for us a little bit and, and tell us about your journey? Did you have uh, a mentor who, who was helpful to you? Uh, you've served in really different cultures all over the world, Asia, the Middle East, et cetera, where uh, we may not only encounter different types of uh, racism, but uh, all kinds of isms. Let's, you know, we could we could list them for a while. So uh, yet here you are, uh, some years later, you stuck with it. And what kind of encouragement and, and what kind of resolve uh, was needed? I was saying that I've had a range of mentors, some that came to me, some that I went after. Um, the ones I went after, I went after because I had specific questions because you don't have to have a long-term relationship with someone. I call them mentoring moments. I had a particular question or a period in my life that I was looking for a specific counsel or advice or viewpoint, just hear how that person navigated it or what they thought about the situation. And then I might not have a conversation with them again or not for another five years. And I act as mentor for many people in just that way. So, I, you know, you say mentor, I need a mentor, but it, it doesn't have to be this long, deep relationship. It can be, but it's not necessary. And, and I, I was lucky. I mean, some people just, you know, thought I was interesting enough. They wanted to know more. And, and I took advantage of that curiosity, that interest in me. Um, and, you know, perforce, most of my mentors have been, European American men, because that's who was in the Foreign Service. Um, those were the people I was working for, working with, working around, and absolutely took advantage of it. I will also say that I come with a strong sense of self, that my parents raised me to know what I bring to the table and to learn what I, what I don't bring, what I don't already know. So it was not easy for people to undermine my own self-confidence. And I urge, you know, oftentimes I'm asked by young women or, or minorities, you know, so 
what's it like being a woman in the State Department? Or what's it like being a woman in the Middle East, for instance? Or what's it like being a brown person in the Middle East? And, and I used to start the question by answering, saying, I don't think about it too much, quite frankly. That's, that's not my aperture of how I'm dealing with the world. Um, when you are a U.S. diplomat, you are a U.S. diplomat. And that's how I approach it. And that's generally how I was received overseas. My colleagues uh, within the department, sometimes I had to work a little harder on them. But certainly as representing the United States, that was how I focused on the world. So I do urge whomever you are coming into the State Department, coming into foreign policy spaces, you come in and you expect to be treated right, respected, valued, and conduct yourself that way. And, and that's how you begin that engagement, in my view, and then you go on from there. So. Great. Uh, thank you. So um, I just want to, before we go to our next question, um, I do want to remind everyone, we're not taking any questions from the chat. There's some good ones popping up, but go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question. So now we're going to Jalal. Jalal, go right ahead. Hi, this is Jalal. I'm from Bahrain, and I'm an IBLP <laughs> alumnus. I was not far away when, you, when uh, Ambassador Gina was in Jeddah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also one of the Faces of Exchange awardee last year. I have two questions. And I hope that I will contribute to solving this uh, uh, diversity and inclusion problem at the Department of State. The first question is about us as IVLP alumni. How can we help? And the second question is, what are the root causes for the problem of DNI in the Department of State? And from there, we can really be effective in reaching to the solution that will mitigate it or will, even if we are hopeful and successful, will erase it at all. Great. So I should mention uh, to those who are uh, have not had the pleasure of encountering uh, the IVLP, that is the International Visitors Leadership Program, uh, which um, many World Affairs Councils um, also implement. Uh, so uh, apparently Jalal uh, participated in, in one of these programs, which is great. Yeah, that's awesome, Jalal. That's awesome that you did. Um, I hope uh, you had good experiences wherever you went around the United States and that I, I think it's an extraordinary program and does a good job of introducing foreign visitors to different aspects of life uh, in America. And so we, we our World Affairs Council in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, welcomes a lot of visitors from around the world and hopefully shows them uh, a, a range of events and, as I said, people uh, in Cleveland and elsewhere. So as a IVLP um, alum, um, talking about your experiences, uh, hopefully all good, but the good and the bad, what you saw about and in America is very important. Uh, anything useful that you took away and who you took it away from is, is very important. And, you know, sharing that is what we ask of you to do. The root causes, in my humble opinion, uh, stem back to the eliteness of our organization. And, and I think for diplomatic corps around the world, um, you know, I've, I've talked to colleagues in different countries about how they get to be diplomats. And I've heard, you know, some say, well, you know, you've got to pass this really our test, you've got to be from the right family, you've got to be from the right group. And so the challenges are not America's alone that make it such an exclusive, narrowly accepting organization, which I don't think helps any country, quite frankly. But we are, you know, if you think about the word excellence in most nations around the world 100 years ago, Somebody who looked like me, who had my gender and my skin color, certainly in the United States, excellence did not include me at all. I had no chance to be included in that definition. So first of all, it's widening our understanding, widening the aperture of that definition. 
And it is not just who my parents and grandparents were and how much money I bring to the table, but also what education, what knowledge, what experience, what languages, what in emotional intelligence that women bring a great deal of. Not solely, but we often, because we have to, we bring emotional intelligence, which is very useful in negotiating, in making contacts, in making friends for your nation. You know, so making sure that we value that. There's some way of judging how much of that you bring to the table, regardless of your gender or gender orientation or anything else. But those sorts of skills are as important um, as the ability to, you know, say that you went to X school or you studied X topic. So once we redefine broaden, because that's what our nation needs now in this incredibly complex world, a very specific set of people and worldviews simply isn't enough. It's not enough. We need more. We need broader. And I think that's how we get after this problem in a long-term way. Great. Thank you. All right. So uh, now we will go to another World Boston friend, Andrew Albertson. Uh, go right ahead, Andrew. Um, Hi, thanks Hi. so much. What a what an amazing discussion. Um, you know, Ambassador uh, Abercrombie Win Stanley. You know, I, I really uh, am grateful to chance to hear this discussion and uh, your remarks today. I wanted to ask you about the question of assignment restrictions. Mm -hmm. and it's something that you know I I have only recently learned about myself. I learned about it uh, from my my friend, you know, former State Department, uh, now Representative Andy Kim. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I was thinking about it when Ambassador Burns, you know, was talking about, well, let's, we need to recruit Egyptian Americans, you know, that had the language skills, had the cultural insights to help us, you know, avoid pitfalls, seize opportunities. But if, if we have folks that are restricted from working in certain areas because they're family members, you know, I feel like we missed that opportunity. Um, and I, I can also certainly imagine where, you know, like with Andy, you know, makes folks feel a little less uh, welcoming at home, you know, in the institution. So I'm curious, you know, what's the Biden administration's approach to this? And should this, um, should assignment restrictions just be ended? Yeah, well, uh, there will be a number of people who agree with you both inside and outside the building, number one, uh, about what we should do about them. The secretary asked, and I think he has now two reports, he was testifying about this yesterday, um, to really understand how it began, what the thinking, what the legal requirements are, and how to ensure that we are not harming and limiting either A, who comes into the department based on this problem, and who stays in the department because of this problem. So absolutely, uh, there will be changes. I can't tell you what the changes are going to be because that's the secretary's prerogative, uh, but it's already had a hard look. I'll tell you when I was announced, it was uh, what the second thing that was discussed. Um, other senior officials are taking a hard look at it. The deputy secretary for management and resources is leading our equity informed policy portion. So, you know, I'm work my office is working with his office. Um, we, we can't afford to waste talent in that way. I have very strong views, but they're not for public consumption. So I will confine myself to, again to say it's getting a very hard look. Well, okay, thank great. you so much. And I just appreciate this discussion. Great to listen in. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so we're gonna try and get in a couple of more questions before we have to uh, wrap up. So we'll go to Gota. Yes, I'm here, Mary. Thank you great. very much. Hello. Thank you for having us and, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, um, for this great talk. Uh, it was um, a, a pleasure. My question actually hinges on um, the comment you and Ambassador Burns made earlier, and that hinges on attrition in foreign service. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Burns, you chimed in in line with um, the problem of diversity and inclusivity in foreign service and how, how do we tackle that problem. 
Um, I have also been lucky uh, to serve as a citizen diplomat with World Boston. So I have been on this side um, of the journey where um, I've, I've represented our country um, as a citizen, um, serving the, the visitors, IVLP visitors who have come to our country to learn the best practices from us. So my observation is perhaps um, do you think that the winds are changing because we you know our population is getting more younger uh, they seek more multinational multilateral relationships um, climate is definitely on our mind we we seek to have less wars more peace more development and then uh, we have the innovation and future of work so that was one of the factors that i thought was an, an observation that may perhaps pertain to the attrition of why perhaps maybe we're not aligned uh, to our goals and the service that we offer. The second one is our own work in women, peace and security at home, meaning our domestic policies and what we do at home and how we represent on the foreign stage. So Ambassador, um, my question is, what do you think is the impact in your thoughts? How can grassroots organizations or civil society organizations help fortify our soft power on the global stage? Okay, well, lots to think. Well, in brief, you're, you're already doing it and thank you. You are important partners for the Department of State and in the foreign policy space, but you too, have challenges with your diversity and inclusion. And there's nobody, there's no organization that looks really like it ought to look at the top in the development space and NGO space. So we're all in this together, let's be clear. Uh, if we do it in partnership, I think we're all going to make the strides that we need to make that continue to allow the United States to be seen as a leader worth emulating and a leader that takes hard, tough looks at itself as we try and improve ourselves. We're fond of saying our more perfect union. It's not perfect, trying to get more perfect. This is the work that we're all doing and, and the partnership is key. So you're already there and, and welcome to the fray. <laughs> Great, thank you. So now we'll go to Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking my call. Like Val Demings, I'm the daughter of a janitor and a maid, and I'm also a longtime employee of the U.S. Department of State, and I represent that population of African Americans who've been employed by the state for 15, 20, 30 years, and so they become apathetic or sort of nonchalant about the term diversity and inclusion. So my question to you is, what do you say to those of us who feel that our issues are more important or than some of the other issues of people who haven't experienced what we in the brown and black skin have, not to discredit other communities, be it LGBTQIA, be it Asians, be it Indians, but how is it that we can get past our ignorance and our lack of understanding of others so that we can achieve true diversity, equity, and inclusion without creating more? Thank you. Thank you, tough question. And I guess I'll look for you in the hallway somewhere if you're a longtime uh, employee. Um, you know, it, it's hard and we have to be very careful about being siloed off into our own pain, frustration, you know, resentment and eagerness for change. The intersectionality of it all is real and it is important. And if you think back to historic times where by slicing and dicing minority communities and keeping us apart, keeping us like crabs, you know, pulling each other down because we think there's only space for one is how we all stay at the bottom. So when I say we've got to work together and acknowledge, then that is really what it is. But I'll be clear, the GAO report made very clear where the priorities need to be at this time. Based on the numbers that the GAO report said for, certainly for the Department of State for leadership positions, it's African-Americans, Hispanics, and women are the places where we actually have gone in the wrong direction, let alone not improved. So the focus of this office, changing the culture in general, but 
the really, really tough questions and focuses from this office are on those three groups to begin with. But the reality is that everything we do for any group in this, this building, and this stuff is tough, it's hard. We're asking hard stuff of people, but it's going to help everyone. As I said, nobody wants something that they didn't deserve. No one wants to be, because this is how black people, brown people feel. Oh, I don't want, I don't want a job just because I'm brown. I didn't ever want a job just because I had black skin or a womb. I, that, that's, I want this perspective, not this. So that goes for everyone. And certainly in this building where we all have an incredibly high opinion of ourselves, whatever our jobs are, we know we're the best in this building doing it, everything. So we need to know the playing field is level. The playing field is level and we deserve what we get. But we're going to have to help each other and that's everyone. That lack of transparency in this building hurts white men as well as brown women, for example. So we're going to be able to make everybody's situation better by making these changes. And we need a posse, ma'am. Got to have everybody on board. I'm in your posse, and I look forward to a situational mentoring opportunity in the future. Please reach Thank out. Please reach Thank out. You. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Wow, what a great, what a great question. Is. Um, and and a very, very inspiring um, set of uh, thoughts to, to mull over, Ambassador. We're going to try and fit in, in the spirit of inclusivity, we're going to try and just fit in one more question uh, because there's so many great questions here. Uh, we're going to go to Holly uh, for a lightning round, and then we'll probably have to wrap up. So Holly, go right ahead. Um, apologies. I think that I was... Um accepted as Holly, but I'm actually Danae O'Brinson. <laughs> oh, hi, what's your You're question? Right. Greetings. And I, I actually, I work at the State Department and I am so happy to see Ambassador Abercrombie Lynn Stanley um, in this uh, new position. And I wanted to ask what we can do um, as, uh, I'm a civil service employee, what we can do internally um, as employees um, and also knowing that it's not just about um, diversity in hiring, it is about retention as well and promotion. And thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You know, one of the things, you know, thanks to people like uh, Ambassador Burns and others around the country, the, the, the thing that we do best <laughs> is recruitment. Um, you know, we figured out places we need to go, we can always do more, but that's where we do the best. It is retention and promotion, which means assignments that we need the most focus on and the most work. Um, one of the things that I am counting on colleagues to do is to speak up, my dear. If you, if something's not right, if it's not working, even as the system says it's supposed to be working and so much does not, we need to know about it. We are trying to make systemic changes, but we need to know where it's not working, where are those little little side paths that get people off track or you know allow some people to move ahead for not reasons that are in black and white um, and where those chokeholds are. And you know we're doing studies, we're looking at the numbers and we're looking at where problems might lie. So you know there's been one that's done that shows that equal numbers, um, respond to advertisement. Equal numbers are certified that they're ready for the job. And yet when the selection is done, we find it's like 63%, 37%. So we know it's in the selection process that we need to take a hard look. So we need that information in order to get after this problem. I love that military term, get after it. We wanna get after it. So you know, what is the selection process? Are people using the best practices? The Foreign Service with the test, we might have some arguments about some of the questions that are asked, but the judgment of having four people, having a diverse array of people doing the interviewing, making sure everyone is asked the exact same question or type of question. These are best practices for reducing you know, bias and the ability, oh, well, I like the way she looks, dresses, she comes from the same town I do. You know, you should know anybody's town, for instance. But those sorts of things are best practices. And I know for a fact that every office in the civil service does their selection whatever way they want to. 
So those are things that we're going to be getting after, for instance, at least that people know what to expect when they're going through a process. And that's going to be a huge change. Nick, as you know, it's so opaque. It's so opaque. We don't know how the system works. So we're going to try and get that transparency there. Thank you. I'm on your podcast. Speak up, though. Speak up. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, unfortunately come to the end of our time. Uh, and Ambassador Abercrombie Wynn Stanley and Ambassador Burns, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, I feel like we're watching history unfold with uh, two wonderful guides. So um, thanks for being here today. And thank you, audience, for your attendance and thoughtful questions. We got to only a small portion, but we're going to take that as a positive indicator of lots of interest in this topic. Okay, thank you all again and have a great afternoon. <laughs>